my wife couldn't be here tonight. She's with our kids in Anacortes, so she asked me to take a picture. I hope you don't mind. So um, my, my love of local history started uh, when I was 10 years old um, in a moment of temporary insanity. Um, my parents sent me on a Greyhound bus um, alone to Seattle where I took two county buses to get to Black Diamond, Washington, where uh, I was to spend a week with my aunt during the summer. And if you've ever been to Black Diamond, Washington, you know that there's very little to do yeah. in Black Diamond. But one thing there is that's awesome in Black Diamond, they have a great community-built and operated museum. And I hadn't ever been to a historical museum by that point in my life. And uh, so this was my first time I spent hours there and uh, just was absolutely fascinated by all the local history and the way they displayed it. It was just a, a great way to take you back in time uh, to those points in history. And what a great gift to their community. And around, uh, around that time, the uh, town of Cedar Woolley was trying to find their identity. Um, their uh, downtown core was starting to atrophy. Um, the uh, uh, bigger stores were leaving town for the shopping malls. They were looking for a new way to identify themselves. What they decided to do was step back in history and adopt some of the uh, character of, of the town from uh, the early century. and. So they started the process in the early 90s of uh, adding the old street lights back, the, the nice awnings on the buildings. And at that point I thought, this museum was so great in Black Diamond, somebody should create a museum in Cedar Woolley. We have all this great history, we have architecture, um, the buildings were, were still intact, they were mostly destroyed in around 1911 in a fire, and so they had been, been rebuilt in brick, and they had withstood the, stand, the, the hands of time. And um, so, you know, I thought, what a great way to pres preserve local history, to create a museum. And about two years later, I had the opportunity, um, a group of uh, people in the town had joined forces and decided to build that museum. And uh, around 1991 was when we formed. And at the age of uh, 13, I joined that committee to build the museum. We had the great gift of having a building that uh, the city owned and they were willing to lease to us for a long time at almost no cost. However, as you can see, it was uh, falling apart. The roof was leaking heavily, the ceiling was falling down, the walls were molding, and so a very dedicated group of about 20 people spent the better part of the next year every single weekend going there and uh, restoring that building. And with the uh, extraordinary help of uh, community service clubs, the Seroptimus, the Rotary, and others, we were able to uh, transform that amazing 13,000 square foot building into a fabulous new museum for the community. And over the years, it continued to expand inside, um, and now it's just completely packed with uh, amazing displays of uh, local artifacts. If you haven't had a chance to get out there, definitely do. Um, you know, it's, it's important uh, history for the entire region, not just the town. And this is my, uh, my family back in Anacortes. My wife, Reagan, my daughter, Rylan, and our uh, son, Benjamin. He's uh, nine months old now. 
So as I was working um, with the museum, and uh, I had a, such a deep interest in local history, I was reading every bit of it that I could. Um, and as I was reading through the history books, the magazines, the newspapers, the articles that were printed about the past in Cedar Woolley, there was one story that kept coming up over and over again. And it was the story of the great Cedar Woolley bank robbery of 1914. And there's two things that I have a big passion for. One is research and one is accurate details. And what I was finding as these stories were printed and I was reading through all the different versions, they were all different. You know, the, the, there, was a, there was a boy killed in the shootout. His age varied from six to 16. Um, the number of bank robbers varied from four to six or seven, and uh, the amount of cash was different. Lots of details were not the same in each story, and I thought somebody should write the complete story of this bank robbery. And about two years later, I had the opportunity to do just that. And uh, as part of a high school research project, I had amazing, an amazing uh, English teacher that was a great uh, mentor. And uh, she uh, inspired the passion of doing the research and making this a much bigger project than it really needed to be for my high school English project. So I set about um, doing the full research, and I like to do things all out. So I went, uh, I went to the Whatcom, uh, or the Bellingham Library, the Whatcom um, uh, County Courthouse. I went up to Canada and did research up there. Um, of course, the newspapers in Cedar Woolley and, and uh, Mount Vernon were, were huge resources. And I started the process of compiling all of this data so that I could eventually write the true story. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of the bank robbery, the events that took place. Um, of course, there's lots more detail in my book. Um, but this is going to give you kind of an overview of, of what took place and sort of set the stage for the upcoming slides. Now, after, after the bank robbery occurred, what was a, a, just an amazing gift um, for me, for my project, for the community, somebody at that point in time had the foresight to actually go out and shoot um, over 100 photographs of the aftermath of the bank robbery, uh, all the people involved, the community members, the sheriff, <clears throat> all the landscape from Cedar Woolley to Canada, and Ferndale. And what they did with those pictures, they turned them into glass lantern slides, and then they distributed those, they produced um, multiple sets, they distributed them to uh, local theaters. So in front of a, a feature film, they would show this uh, presentation of the slides of this bank robbery, the news of the day, and um, they had a script that went along with it. So they would read the script, they would probably play music in the background. And some of the local news reports actually mentioned also that they, uh, they uh, some theaters, they would have somebody in the back with a, a, a fake gun and shoot it and <laughs> scare all the attendees. <laughs> so the events of the bank robbery actually started more than a week before the event took place. So up and down the, uh, the Pacific coast from, from Vancouver to Seattle and beyond, they were having a big rash of bank robberies. Um, so everyone was on edge. All the bank tellers were worried, wondering if they were going to be the ones that were hit next. 
And about a week before the bank robbery on October 17th, 1914, the uh, bank tellers in the area had seen some suspicious looking characters loitering around and assumed that these were probably uh, bank robbers that were going to be hitting their establishment. So they pulled the community together. They uh, armed everybody and prepared for a potential bank robbery. And the following week, October 17th, which actually was a Saturday evening, didn't know they were open on Saturday evenings, but they were. Um, Saturday evening, the, um, I'm gonna point to the map here just to give you some perspective. Um, the bank is right here, the First National Bank. Um, you'll hear um, mention of Mott's Drugstore, Union Mercantile. These are the, the corner places that were hit with most of the bullets. Down here is the Vendome Hotel. So Saturday evening, <coughs> the uh, bank teller at the First National Bank, John Goodall, was uh, preparing to take his um, uh, deposit, um, stash it in the, uh, the safe and, and be done for the night. And as everybody was prepared, the, uh, the law enforcement were prepared and, and ready. They were stationed around the bank. And there was a disturbance over there at the Vendome Hotel. A drunk woman was uh, making a, uh, a scene and screaming and the law enforcement officers made their way down to the hotel which gave the bank robbers the perfect opportunity. So <clears throat> they entered the bank with guns drawn, five of them, and started shooting, which raised the hackles of all the other people in town that had guns, and they came out. <laughs> and they started shooting as well. So several minutes and hundreds of bullets later. The result of that um, was that none of the bank robbers were shot. Um, all of the windows within the blocks of the bank were shot out. Um, and the one, uh, one sad part of, of this whole comical story, unfortunately, a young boy by the name of Melvin Wilson, um, 13 years old, by the way, was coming out of his house right about there. He heard the shots, and without thinking, he just ran out and was struck by a stray bullet and died of his injuries. Um, another gentleman across the street uh, was hit in the leg, and those were the only two people out of hundreds of shots that were hit by bullets. So the, um, the bank robbers um, finally got um, the point of the, uh, the bank teller, um, jabbed a gun in his side, and um, told him they didn't believe his story, that his uh, safe was on a timed lock, they uh, got into the safe. They pulled out the bags of uh, gold and silver. They cut them open. They removed the ones with silver and left them behind and took all the ones with gold. In all, they took $11,649 worth of gold at that point in time um, and made their escape. They, uh, they got out. They followed the railroad track to the north. Um, the, uh, somebody, uh, sent a message over to the, uh, uh, phone exchange and let them know that the bank had been robbed. Uh, the, uh, phone operator phoned, uh, the sheriff, Ed Wells, in Mount Vernon and let him know and he immediately set out in his car to Cedar Willey. Um, actually on the back cover of, of my book, um, there's a little scrap of paper that the museum has. It was donated to them a couple of years ago. Such a treasure to have. Um, 
it actually says the first national bank was just robbed. And it's presumed that that was the sheet of paper that was passed to the bank or to the uh, phone operator to let her know. So very fascinating. Um, very quickly, they organized a posse of people and uh, set out on, on the trail of the bank robbers. This is a current map. Um, the, uh, the line shows uh, the general direction, definitely not the actual route that they took. They mostly, um, it's assumed that they, they followed the railroad tracks. So 77 miles is what I've calculated on foot um, over the course of about a week. Um, so they went north from Cedar Woolley, um, crossed the border near Blaine, and the first, uh, first shootout after the bank robbery occurred uh, in the town of Hazelmere, just north of the border. It's uh, near Cloverdale. So up to Hazelmere, the, uh, the bank robbers went. The uh, posses were hot on their trail. They um, discovered them up across the border, and there was a shootout up there between uh, authorities and the bank robbers. And in that process, two of the five bank robbers were shot and killed, and a Canadian uh, immigration officer was shot and killed at that point in time. He was, uh, I believe, 23 years old, young guy. And I actually had the uh, good fortune of finding his gravesite up in uh, New Westminster. After uh, the shootout up there, they, um, to their eventual demise, ended up crossing back over the border and uh, followed down to Ferndale where the second shootout took place. Um, Sheriff Wells um, had uh, driven in his, his car to Cedar Woolley and then drove it uh, north and continued uh, the investigation up there. The, um, in Ferndale, they, um, they had figured that the, the gentlemen were coming down the railroad. They um, took the headlight off of Sheriff Wells' car and rigged it to the railroad bridge in Ferndale. And uh, as, they, as they had hoped, the, uh, the bank robbers continued down the railroad tracks and across the bridge, and as they got halfway across, they fl flipped the light on and blinded them and proceeded to shoot at them. Um, they killed uh, two more of the five bank robbers at that point. And uh, that, uh, after that, the, uh, the fifth bank robber disappeared. So in Hazelmere, they recovered uh, approximately a third of the $11,000 in gold. In Ferndale, they recovered approximately another third, and another third remains unfound at this point in time. And if you're curious, it equals about $375,000 in today's value. So get your metal detectors out. <laughs> um, so during my process of research, I, I just, I was very fortunate uh, of the timing that um, that I was able to do this. The, uh, the daughter of uh, Mr. Goodall, the, the bank manager, was still alive. She was in her 90s. Um, I had the good fortune of interviewing her. Um, somewhere I have that on tape. I'll have to dig it out. Um, that was fascinating. Um, I also had the good fortune of uh, interviewing the son of Sheriff Wells. He was in Mount Vernon, um, and he, in his, in his home, he had a framed uh, badge. I've got a picture in the book of it. It's not a great picture, unfortunately, but it was a badge that was given to him as uh, a gift from the bank uh, in Cedar Woolley, and 
it has a uh, gold coin in the center of it and a bullet dent in that gold coin. And uh, it was a gift of appreciation for all his hard work. They did, uh, they did return the recovered gold to the bank. Um, that's kind of a side story. The, the uh, treasurer in, in Whatcom County returned the gold before the auditors said he could. Um, so he got in trouble. He actually had his pay docked by the commissioners as a result. You're gonna see this a uh, couple more times. Um, in the slideshow, so the, the pictures that you're gonna see following are the uh, photos from the, um, the original glass lantern slides. Um, a set of those were donated to the Cedar Woolley Museum a few years ago, and they were um, able to get a, a grant from the state to have those digitized, and that's what we used in the book. But uh, coming up, there will be uh, four pictures of dead men. So the uh, red exclamation mark is fair warning. So as I go along here, um, the uh, text that I'm reading is the actual um, script that went with the slides. Um, so that's uh, verbatim. So this one is a view of the main street of Cedar Woolley looking north. The bank situated on the northeast corner and the building containing also the Wixon Hotel and a pool room. A street scene taken at night showing the situation of the lights at the time of the robbery. It was actually at night, which uh, I guess contributed to nobody hitting each other. Later, the lights of the bank being put out left the robbers in the dark and the officers and citizens of Cedar Willie in the light, giving all possible advantage to the robbers. This is Mr. Carlin, who was wounded in the leg while crossing the street by a bullet from one of the bandits. After becoming a deputy, he was very active in the final capture of the robbers. Officer Jasper Holman of Cedar Woolley. Just love these pictures. What a treasure. Chief of Police Beebe. Officer Beebe being armed with a 38 automatic rifle was stationed at the other bank. Uh, it was uh, just down on the other block. When the firing started, he attempted to advance up the street. Finding that impossible, he went into an alley by the Vienna Bakery, emptying his rifle and his revolver at the bandits. Not a good shot. <laughs> officer Villeneuve, this officer being stationed at the bank, was driven across the street, hiding directly behind Mr. Mott's drugstore. He emptied his rifle and revolver, revolver at the bandits, and while returning to the police station for more ammunition, the robbery was completed. Father, mother, and sister of little Melvin Wilson, who lost his life on the night of October the 17th. Little Melvin Wilson, at the time of the robbery, start the t at the time the robbery started, was at his home directly across the street. Not even stopping to get his hat, he rushed out, and his mother, seeing him go out the door, little thought it would be the last time she would see her son alive. Little Melvin Wilson crossed the street to the railroad track, still thinking it was merely sport. He started toward the bank, and a bullet from one of the bandits stopped his young career. Spot showing where Melvin Wilson was shot. Mr. Goodall, the cashier of the bank, was brave and plucky and fought until he was cornered, but finally had to open the vaults. You'll see some breaks on some of the slides. Fortunately, um, most of them survived the past hundred years.
Mr. Frank LeBold, the bookkeeper of the First National Bank, who was sitting on his stool at his work with a gun at easy reach when the robbery occurred, but was unable to use it. Mr. J. Marsden, the assistant cashier, showing a bullet hole through his coat through which the bullet had passed. Right there on the right. Lucky guy. Sheriff Thomas of Whatcom County, who followed the bandits to their final capture. Sheriff Wells of Skagit County, who was in Cedar Woolley an hour after the robbery occurred and who never left the scene until the capture of the bandits. Mr. Brock Jr., Deputy of Bellingham. Mr. Barney Hansen of Blaine deputized for the reason that he knew every foot of the roads and trails in and around the international border. Maurice Dean, electrician of Blaine, who arranged the light on the railroad bridge at Ferndale. Showing the method the robbers used in entering and shooting up the bank, they ducked down beneath the counter where bandits shot through with the intent to cripple the cashier. One of the uh, descendants of Mr. Goodall actually has the, uh, the chair from his office that has a bullet hole in it. Unfortunately, it's there in Arizona. <laughs> where several shots were fired through the partition at the cashier, 52 shots were fired from the interior of the bank. After their guns were emptied, another bandit entered from the rear, breaking open the back door, covering bank officers with his guns, forcing the cashier, bookkeeper, and assistant cashier into the back room where they all gathered at the vault. More bullet holes. Mr. Goodall attempted to tell them that it was on a timed lock. He answered them that he knew better and he better open it up, therefore mis forcing Mr. Goodall to open the vault and pass out the bags containing the money. Showing the bags cut open by the robbers and separating the gold from the silver, then passing through the back door of the bank and out into the night. Side view of the bank showing a telephone pole at the rear of the bank directly across the street from the rear of Mr. Mott's drugstore by which one of the bandits stood. Eleven clips were found on the ground. Each clip had contained nine cartridges showing that 99 shots had been fired from this place. Just amazing. Showing the destruction of the big plate glass in the front of the bank. showing the destruction of the windows at close range. This is the back of a chair with a bullet lodged in it, presumably that one in Arizona. View showing the broken glass door in Bank President Wixon's private office. Showing the window, windows of the Union Mercantile Company directly across the street which was completely destroyed during the battle, over $300 damage done to the store.
Mr. Jack Barrick, clerk of the Union Mercantile Company, standing in the exact position he was the night of the robbery, showing a bullet hole a few inches from his head, driving him inside. Lots of lucky people in Cedar Woolley. Showing another shot taken at Jack while getting into the store. Showing damage done to President Wixon's $3,000 car. Showing damage done to the hardware store opposite the bank. Those are breaks on the slide in the corner there. The window of a private <clears throat> residence through which a bullet passed, lodging in a picture frame, which barely missed the mistress of the house. Bullet holes in the concrete outside the bank where the officers attempted to get the bandits. Back door which the leader of the bandits kicked in to give assistance to his comrades. The back street down which the bandits took after making their haul passing out over this railroad. The railroad at the time was under construction but since has been completed. At that time there were 400 men working on this road. Four miles down this road, they entered the forest, this forest being dense and impenetrable to, the camp where the, to, the, to where the camp was located. Their camp consisted of a natural abode protected from all sides by windfalls, showing smooth places on the logs where they had slid over them coming and going from the camp and showing the camp had been inhabited. Between the logs was covered with moss <clears throat> and covered with small windfalls where they slept. These black places shows, show where they had their fires. <clears throat> a lookout tree showing the seat at the base of the tree where a constant lookout was kept upon the railroad twigs being broken away for about 300 yards so this view could be obtained. This camp was accidentally found by a hunter who immediately reported it to the police. The police going to this camp found evidence and maps to the effect that they had probably been there four or five weeks. Tom Wyckoff, U.S. immigration officer stationed at Ferndale. showing the road they took passing through Blaine, the old and new Great Northern Railroad. A view showing, through where, showing where they passed through Blaine. View showing where the robbers passed through Blaine, ducking under the electric light in a crouching position about 20 feet apart, as seen by Deputy Philip Schaffner, who reported them to the officers in Blaine, who attempted to head them off before they got into Canada, but they were too late. Showing the scene on the old Great Northern Railroad that the robbers took just before crossing the boundary line. Douglas Station at the boundary line where deputies Hyde and McDonald were stationed. But owing to the darkness and the precaution which the bandits took, they got by the deputies before being noticed. The signal alarm was given by firing six shots in quick succession, thereby warning all the deputies on both sides that the, the bandits had crossed into Canada. View of Deputies Hyde and Frank McDonald. Looking east on the boundary line and about two miles in distance from the Douglas Station lies the old Chinese or Smuggler's Trail, 
This vicinity was heavily guarded by the sheriffs and deputies on this night. Seen on the old Great Northern Line where the first bloody battle took place, resulting in the loss of three lives and two wounded. Thicket where the robbers concealed themselves before the battle. And spot showing where the pockmarked bandit was found dead. Fair warning. A good view of the pockmarked bandit. Spot showing where Great Northern Detective Keefe was wounded in the gun hand. So as you'll read in the book, he uh, was trained to shoot at the robbers. He was actually hit by a bullet um, in his hand and wasn't able to fire after that. He slipped over the side of the, the bank and, and stayed there until after the battle was done. And that was also where the Canadian immigration officer was killed. This shows where Clifford Adams fell after being shot through the heart. Clifford Adams, the very promising young man in the Immigration Services of Canada, a good, clean man in every respect, liked by all his associates, and a brave and fearless man as ever worked for any government, he gave his life in the performance of his duty. This spot shows where the second bandit was found wounded about a quarter of a mile down from the scene of the battle, shot once through the hip at the battle at the railroad crossing and later was shot in the head by one of his fellow men when un unable to keep up with them any longer. He lived 36 hours after being found. View of the bandit who was shot by his pals. And turning the camera around and standing on the track where the first battle took place and about 35 feet in distance is the place where some, year, some six years ago, Mrs. Morrison was murdered, having her throat cut from ear to ear by a mulatto who made his escape afterward. He was caught, convicted, and hung at New Westminster, BC. team, wagon, and driver who conveyed the bodies of the bandits to the jail at Cloverdale, BC. A group of US and Canadian officers in front of the jail at Cloverdale. Bullets, clips, and cartridges watch and chain that were taken from the bandits. By noticing very closely, you will notice that the charm on the watch chain is a miniature revolver, thus showing you in what way their minds run. I'd love to find all that evidence. Burning the clothes of the bandits at Cloverdale, BC. Deputies from the U.S. guarding the highways near Cloverdale. Looks like a movie, doesn't it? Yeah. Hat showing a bullet hole. This hat was worn by U.S. Immigration or U.S. Inspector Burke, which shows the narrow escape he had from losing his life. showing how they guarded every fence, corner, and by trail. U.S.
U.S. and Canadian deputies with bloodhounds searching the forest for the bandit's trail. Sheriff Wells and his automobile that were hot on the bandit's trail from start to finish. The light of this automobile was the one used at Ferndale to light the bridge over which the bandits tried to pass. Showing how the skid roads and highways were guarded on the day after the shooting near Hazelmere, BC. A group of deputies that were on the bandits trail under Sheriff Wells of Skagit County. Showing the route which the bandits took in returning to the United States, passing through the old Chinese or smugglers trail, which was so heavily guarded the night before, but clear the following day. A good view of the old Chinese or smugglers trail. Not really, but that's what it says. Powder House near Blaine, where the bandits stopped overnight. The home of Mrs. Wilson, the house where the men stopped after fatigue and hunger had forced them to show themselves to civilization. Rapping on the door, Mrs. Rapping at the door of Mrs. Wilson, they asked for food, but not having any meat in the house, she gave them six loaves of bread and two rolls of butter. Then telling her to go into the house, they warned her not to come out again until 12 o'clock, this taking place at 8 o'clock in the morning. View of Mrs. Wilson, the kind lady who fed the bandits. Farmer McGee, who saw and talked to the bandits, he leaving the fi his field to go to his house for his noonday meal. Noticing three men coming down the road, he lingered at the gate to have a talk with them, but they also wished to talk to him and stopped and asked the way to Custer, carrying on an ordinary conversation for at least five minutes. All this time, Farmer McGee was closely scrutinizing their countenance, dress, and appearance, and coming to the conclusion that they were the bandits, he notified the authorities. Farmer McGee and his boys showing the road that they took after leaving his farm. Mr. McGee is a highly respected colored gentleman having lived in the vicinity of Blaine for some years. Previous to his residence near Blaine, he was a U.S. Deputy Marshal for nine years in Mobile Cal County, Alabama. Deputy Roselle, who took a very important part in the capture of the bandits at Ferndale. Deputy Conklin, who was also very prominent in the capture of the bandits at Ferndale. A close view of Deputy Roselle. At my uh, first book signing at the museum, a gentleman came forward and let me know that he was uh, the grandson of Deputy Roselle, and he hadn't actually realized at that point that that was the, the guy on the front cover of my book. So he bought, he bought 12 of them. <laughs> He's actually a shooting instructor. The bridge crossing the, Ferndale, the river at Ferndale where Mr. Wells and his deputies were stationed on each side of the river. A view of the railroad bridge a few yards further up the river guarded by Sheriff Thomas, Deputy Sheriff Stewart, and others from Whatcom County. The shed where the deputies stood one or two hours before the bandits crossed. Another view of the bridge. The bandits had reached within about 20 feet of the other side when they were discovered. 
They were promptly ordered to halt. Failing to obey, they were given one more chance. Halt! Bang, bang, bang! I'm assuming that's when they would shoot in the background of the theater, right? Showing one of the bandits killed a charge of buckshot entering his left side and coming through his breast. Showing the other bandit, which was shot in the head with a charge of buckshot also, but still lived an hour and 20 minutes after. This man was a most perfect muscled man. His muscles on his body, as you can see, large and numerous. His physical strength being equal to half a dozen ordinary men. Don't know who wrote this stuff. Showing the spot where the two bandits fell about 10 feet apart, the tallest being shot in the head, and the spots there showing stains of blood. It was quick. That was uh, the end of my slideshow. What happened to the guy who got away? That is a great question. Um, <clears throat> there, were, there were several leads um, that uh, Sheriff Wells followed. Um, there were a couple gentlemen up in Seattle that he went up to check out. Um, unfortunately, they uh, didn't have enough uh, evidence to identify um, anybody that they interviewed, and uh, so that fifth uh, bandit was never captured. How were, uh, how were people contacting the sheriffs and, and communicating through all this? I'm a little surprised to think of phones being around. Right, out yeah. In those places. That's, uh, that's a great question. I wondered that myself. The, uh, the speed at which the uh, posses were organized, you would think that they had text messaging at that point. They didn't. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, um, the phone system, I'm assuming, was uh, adequate enough to reach the, the people that need to be reached. Yes. Was were, the, there uh, any... were the bandits on foot during all this time? Yes, they were on foot uh, the entire time. So very fascinating, 77 miles of uh, on foot at least. Was there um, any information about how long all this hail of bullets that took place in Cedar Well, It sounds kind of like a Charlie Chaplin movie. I yeah, yeah, people definitely running does. Around and you know, it was, uh, I believe it was in the course of um, about five minutes. Very quick, but lots of shots. Uh, who were the bandits? Were they ever identified? Um, they they look like they were, must have been incredibly poor. I saw one of the pictures of the shoes. Right. The shoes were all worn out, so they must have been real desperado. Yeah, so, you know, they um, they uh, made an assumption that they were part of a larger gang of uh, criminals that were operating from Seattle to Vancouver. Um, <clears throat> they were assumed to be uh, either Russian or Polish. Um, unfortunately, they were never positively identified. They had no identification on them, and nobody claimed them. The, uh, so the um, two bank robbers that were killed in Ferndale, they're buried uh, at the Bayview Cemetery here in Bellingham. Um, unmarked graves in the records list them as uh, unknown uh, Cedar Woolley bank robber. So you've obviously done a lot of research. Give us a couple of tips and the things you wouldn't expect to look into that you got data from. Um, I think one of, one of my favorite things that I found was uh, the um, commissioner's docket from Whatcom County. Um, one of them showed uh, the um, expense report, which had the uh, burial of the bank robbers listed and cost them 50 bucks. And uh, they also had some of the, uh, um, the cemetery also had the uh, burial records, which had some details, it's uh, in my book as well. 
Um, I was fortunate enough to, uh, at the, the point in time that I was researching, I, I actually worked for um, the Skagit Valley Herald. And uh, I, I know, I believe at this point you cannot access their um, print archives. Um, they're falling apart. Fortunately, at that point in time, I was able to get in there. I'm not sure if they have those uh, digitized or not at this point. But uh, the Whatcom, or the Bellingham Library, was awesome with the, uh, the newspapers on microfilm. Um, how long did the chase last? Uh, the chase was, uh, I believe it was a week, start to finish. And then uh, they had another a week or two where they were chasing leads for that fifth bandit. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned the possibility of them being Russian or Polish. Um, two questions on that is, um, what was the evidence of that? And the narrative states that they, they spoke to two people, the, the farmer and the, uh, the farm or the housewife that mm -hmm. had fed them. Um, did either of those witnesses offer anything suggesting accent or linguistic ability or, or tendency that might have suggested a nationality other than English? In other words, what was their English, if there any, is any evidence of that? Yeah, you know, I, <clears throat> I wondered the same thing um, in terms of the people that they ran into. Um, unfortunately, they... Um, in the reports that I was able to read, they made no mention of accents. Um, and uh, from what I could tell in all the newspaper articles that I read, um, the, the assumption was made based on their, their physical appearance. What is the name of your English teacher that inspired you so? Um, Kathy Ream is the name of my English teacher. She uh, is now a... Uh, extremely good family friend, and uh, we love her to death. Do you have any idea where the robbers were trying to get to? The, the escape route seems to be completely aimless. Right. <laughs> yeah, I wondered uh, why they didn't just continue up into Canada. They probably could have uh, lived at that point. Um, however, um, the fact that they did uh, switch back and, and start south and um, you know, all the um, evidence that perhaps somebody had made it to Seattle, I wonder if um, they were trying to get back to the other half of their gang of criminals. The, the drawing of downtown Cedar Woolley showed the Swastika Cafe. And um, yep. I, I know it had a different meaning prior to Nazism, but yep. uh, do you know anything about that? Um, you know, I don't recall what the, uh, the original um, meaning of the swastika symbol was. Unfortunately, uh, Hitler um, ruined it, whatever it was. Um, but yeah, there, was, uh, there were many swastikas on that building um, up until the point that it became popular and then they painted them into squares. I, th I think they're still there. Do you have any idea the approximate value of the $11,649 in today's currency? Um, a, a third of it, the, the remaining um, funds I calculated out at 375000 so it would be close to a million dollars. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>